Okay, good morning, everybody. We have um, quite an action-packed day for you in what is arguably one of the most important classes of heterocycles that uh, you will encounter in the real world. And um, so there, there is a nice chapter on pure zoles, which is one of the most frequent ones you'll encounter that you can uh, take a look at and review, including uh, a nice starburst here, as well as a report card to guide you in making some of these. The hardest part of making pure zoles and related structures comes down to one word, and that is regiochemistry. That's often the problem that uh, is posed to the practitioner in some of the most profound and confusing ways is getting the right regiochemistry in around the ring, whether you're doing some sort of alkylation chemistry, substitution chemistry, or just ring synthesis, as we'll see today. So with that, let's begin. Uh, there are some good general ways of making uh, pyrazoles and isoxazoles. We're, we're going to cover um, isothiazoles uh, tomorrow or Wednesday. Uh, but the general ways of making pyrazoles and isoxazoles generally fall into two categories that you're going to see. One of them is condensation on the left-hand side, and the other one is through some sort of 1,3-dipolar cycle addition. So the condensation can happen either from a 1,3-dicarbonyl um, that is just derived, as you see on the left, or it can be some sort of equivalent to a 1,3-dicarbonyl. So just as we talked about in every heterocyclic class so far, they can all be brought back to their constituent carbonyl precursors. And then you can come up with all sorts of innovative, interesting alternatives and surrogates for those precursors that can then serve as uh, condensation partners. You can also derive those 1,3-dicarbonyls from things like oxymes and hydrozones. And that can be extremely valuable, as we will see multiple times today, to solve this existential regiochemical problem that is encountered. And then you've got the dipolar cycle additions, uh, which we'll cover a few of them, some very, very useful ones, uh, from either nitrile oxides that are derived from the dehydration of a alkyl nitro compound, or through simply uh, loss of HCl on a chlorooxime that can be derived from the corresponding oxime just by treating with something like t-butyl hypochlorite or NCS. The nitrile imines can, all, can be similarly accessed from the corresponding uh, hydrozones. And we'll see examples of how these approaches can be tactically used in both pyrazoles and isoxazole synthesis. Now, in addition to the 2021 lecture is uh, clearing up what I think historically has been the source of a lot of confusion, ambiguity, and questions through the years, not to mention tons of different consulting quagmires, which is the rules and regulations for hydrazine addition. Now, if you're adding a 1,2 dinucleophile, obviously, and one of the uh, nucleophilic partners is substituted, there is this problem of which one is going to add. And uh, this tiny little box here tries to make sense of some of it. Unfortunately, the tiny little box has exceptions to it, and we will, we will see some of those. Um, but in general, and this summarizes probably, you know, 90% of the cases out there, if your alkyl hydrazine uh, is going to be condensing, uh, usually there are conditions where you will get the NH2 to win out over the uh, substituted portion. That is, this one tends to do the condensation chemistry. But if there's some sort of nucleophilic first step that we will see later, then it tends to be that nitrogen that uh, will win out. And if it's an R is equal to aryl, then G, mm, it's a case by case. And um, if it's electron deficient, obviously the NH2 will win out. Um, if it's uh, electron rich, sometimes the substituted position can win out. And then all of these rules can be broken if you have an R group, which is sufficiently sterically hindered. So it can get confusing. In the past uh, 15 iterations of this class, we never covered this. It was my mistake, we should have. Uh, but the problem is there's no good paper that says, here are the rules, here's how to predict it. So all we can come up with is sort of based upon anecdotal things we've seen over the years, these are the things that generally tend to explain the ob observed regiochemical outcomes. So this should answer a lot of the questions you may have today. Refer back to this little box if you get confused about hydrazine addition regioselectivity. Okay, let's take a look at um, some details of how these workaround routes that don't really fit into the 1,3-dicarbonyl directly con condensing or cycloaddition strategy, how do some of these uh, little exceptions work? That is, 
the from ox oxym or hydrazone strategy. So for example, number one, we can take this uh, oxym treated with uh, Bewley and uh, then DMF. And uh, what do you think uh, there, uh, Sung Han, is going to happen when we uh, add uh, Bewley and then quench this with DMF? Uh, I think the butyrolysin will be prolonged at the alpha position of oxime. Right. So you'll get, you know, a double deprotonation event. You'll then get a quenching. One, two, three. We've already got our nucleophile built into it. So all this thing needs to do now is just cyclize. And we have our nice little isoxazole. Let's take a look at example number two. Uh, Sung Han, why don't you keep us going here since you did that one kind of effortlessly. So I think the alkyne anion will attack and substitute the bromide. And that will lead us down And again, we've got here one, two, three, a conceptual equivalent that when we treat with potassium carbonate and methanol, it will happily isomerize to this compound. Great. Now, you know, just parenthetically go back in these examples and take a look and think about uh, how you would get regiochemical control if you had to start from the 1,3-dicarbonyl, right? Remember that. It could be difficult. Think about this one. How would you make that from the 1,3-dicarbonyl? And, and guarantee me my regiochemistry. That is, if I had a ketone here and here, how would you guarantee me that the hydroxylamine would give me the right regiochemistry? Not so easy, right? So that's why people do this. Let's take a look at another example. In this case, we've got uh, some sort of horner wadsworth emmons reaction going on. And that gives us, obviously, the olefin. And uh, upon continued treatment with base, sodium hydride, this will then cyclize. And you've got base in there, continuing to go on. And um, you'll lose tosyl. And out will pop the product. Great. Now, uh, one of my favorite ways of making pyrazoles that has uh, saved me on many occasions is in uh, exemplified by problem of the day number one. So we need a volunteer for problem of the day number one, or I could just call on someone. Anyone in the mood to earn some pyridoge today? I can give it a shot. What do you say, Carter? Um, so with the sodium nitrite um, and NHCl mixture, I think you can get the N N O bond at the secondary amine. That sounds pretty awesome. Now what? And then with acetic anhydride, um, you can react that with the acid and then uh, with the O of the, uh, of the NO moiety add in to the uh, first one, yeah. And uh, that looks like a really strange creature you just made me draw.
This is called a synone. And like a munch known, it will happily do uh, a one three dipolar cycle addition. The beauty of the synone, I think the reason that some folks are reluctant to remember it or just cast it off as a kind of crazy curiosity that they're never going to use in their life um, is because it looks like a species that wouldn't be stable, but actually it is quite stable. You can run columns on these compounds. They're nice, well-behaved. You can even do substitution chemistry on these. So in the case where there are here is equal to an H, people do functionalizations and treat it like a normal heterocycle that you can manipulate. Uh, take it through a sequence of steps. It's nice and happy and stable, which is, I think, rather shocking and surprising because you can't do that with the munch known. But the sidnone is quite stable. And uh, when the sidnone will react with an alkyne, for example, it does its 1,3 dipolar cycle addition. And uh, let's draw that intermediate just so everyone is on the same page. which after loss of CO2 delivers you your desired pyrazole. This can be a extremely useful way of making pyrazoles. I've seen it used in companies quite a bit. Um, let's take a look at how it can be used in the most unique and uh, empowering ways, starting with this example. So if I were to show you this example without knowing anything about sidnone chemistry at all, we would simply use the rules we've been doing over and over again, which is to label ring A and ring B. And uh, very likely you would uh, break open, I think most people would break open ring B. Brendan, wouldn't you? Um, yeah, I think that's right? feasible, yeah. Why would you break ring B? What's the key bond that we want to break in ring B? Uh, the... Uh... The one, two bond? Yeah, just a simple alkylation. It certainly looks really logical to do that. And then once we do that, we go back up to the chart and we say, oh, uh, well, this thing can be easily made from just a dicarbonyl compound. Let me need to put some group here to protect it. Let's just put it, keep it as X and you could put it as OR. But then we have to make this thing. Uh, Regio chemistry is not a concern because we're just using hydrazine. So it definitely is reasonable. Uh, but what if I told you there was a way of making this in one step? Can you see it? Can you use... Um... Proline? Oh, yes. Carter, for the Pyridose jackpot. And you'd be done. So imagine the competing medicinal chemist to make that key scaffold for SAR. Carter is done in an hour, and the other person is struggling away for many days. Who gets the promotion? All right, let's take a look at this other one. Uh, this is an interesting one. You've got that B pin and, and, you know, I think most people would look at this and say, well, um, all right, we only know how to do regular uh, pyrazole synthesis logic. So the first thing we're going to do is um, think of that B pin coming from a Miora borrelation, of course. And uh, this compound probably comes back from um, some sort of NBS bromination.
And uh, this compound, where does this thing come from? Well, we need a 1,3-dicarbonyl. So uh, let's imagine we've got um, that. And uh, we want to add in that. Uh, now, which, uh, what is the potential problem with this route? based on what we opened this lecture up, I think in the first sentence with. The regiochemistry. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Yes, so uh, can you be sure which side uh, you're gonna get here? I mean, I'm not so sure myself. I wouldn't propose it because I'm just not sure. I mean, you might be able to find some good precedent for getting the right regiochemistry. But anyway, it's a lot of steps to do something that you could potentially do from Anyone want to say where we would get this from? The uh, B-pen alkyne. And? Um, you'll have the like phenylamine, um, I guess like with an alpha ester on it. So a glycine derivative. So sidnones come from amino acids as uh, Carter mentioned before with proline. And as we saw in problem of the day number one, we're starting with an amino acid. And so, yeah, we take this glycine derivative, which is readily available. And uh, it's obviously easy to put a hundred different analogs in that phenyl position. And um, you just go in straight with that. The regio chemistry gives you as the major product, the one you want. And um, then you do your Suzuki. So you pretty much get, get to your compound extremely quickly. So uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, yeah. For re regio chemistry, is it so we are kind of assuming we have the delta plus next to the bipin? Correct. Is that, is that because uh, of the uh, um, so it's not ster sterically controlled? It's actually because of the delta plus there. Um, it is because of the delta plus, and it's important to note as well this doesn't give perfect regio chemistry, the example I show here. So there's a syndone review. It's also in the book. You can see that um, you will often get mixtures with a, a case like this. And um, it is dictated by an interplay of sterics and electronics. And um, even though if you were to get a one-to-one -one mixture in this case, it's still far more desirable than going through the other route uh, where you, you, know, you get a first a potential reach of chemical mixture, then you have to do the MBS and you have to do the MEOR borrelation versus just directly getting at your compound from, from a glycine derivative. I so see, use I use Sidnone, use Sidnone regio um, um, cycloadditions with caution and armed with literature precedent in the real world where you know you're going to get the right regio chemical outcome. Okay, thanks. And the delta plus there is because the uh, butyl is more left on donating. I, I, I put the wrong at the wrong spot. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it is a uh, electron a weak which electron acts as a weak electron withdrawing group. Okay, great. So let's move on to this consulting corner here where we've got to make this amino pyrazole with the desired um, regiochemical outcome. And uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that the practitioners in this case would like to navigate our space with a, a lot of variability. So they want to make a lot of analogs around the R group. So any, any ideas of where we can start um, on, a, on a compound like this? A 1,3 carbonyl, I mean, is worth drawing out. A 1,3 carbonyl is worth drawing out. And what what uh, what uh, do we make of this position here? Well, I guess I would take that off because you can add that late stage. Okay, so um, you're going to try to do um, some sort of bromination there and then, or nitration. Would either work? Where do you think it would go? Onto the nitrogen instead. Well, won't, won't really go into the nitrogen. Um, but often you'll see a selectivity uh, preference towards that position. Um, so that could be an issue for you. 
in terms of putting that in the end. So we're going to probably need to avoid uh, that disconnection, and we probably want to keep that in there from the beginning. But if we go back and a sort of religious interpretation of what you said before, um, that highlighted carbon just goes back to a uh, nitrile, right? And so now if we take this and we react it with What is the potential issue here? Well, again, again. yeah, again, we've got the regiochemical quagmire and we learned above that, um, you know, probably it's gonna be that nitrogen, especially with the AR that does the first condensation. And that means that the regiochemistry of this AR will end up over here, which is gonna be uh, potentially a problem. So there's one way of getting around that, which would be, you could take this compound and you could simply Bach protect it. Take that, separately stir it up with this until you get a condensation, and then gently treat that with acid like TFA, dry TFA, to get the proper regiochemical outcome. So certainly, that is a potential option for you. Another potential option would be to imagine that this amino group simply arises as a consequence of a late stage courteous rearrangement. So another trick I like to use are when I see aminos on a heterocycle that are in somewhat difficult positions, I always like to think of, of a courteous as being a secret placeholder for that amine. And now when we have that uh, ester there, there's a few things we can think about doing. Um, one of them is of course, just a nitrile imine cycloaddition. So you can imagine an alkyne plus that would uh, likely give you, uh, the, it could give you the right regiochemistry. Um, the other possibility is acidinone. And that would just be derived from a library of amino acids with all permutations potentially available to you. So you're just giving the medicinal chemist a lot of options to screen. Which of these routes is the best? They're all on paper fine. All of them are fine to propose on paper. And then when you get to the lab, how do you choose? Well, you choose based upon what building blocks you have. All right, so let's take a look at some case studies of pyrazoles from the literature, some pretty famous ones. So Celebrex, uh, you probably have, maybe some of you have taken this, certainly someone in the audience has taken this compound. It's a COX inhibitor for pain, a uh, very popular compound. And we talked about in lecture number one, I think, why Biox was taken over the, off the market. And subsequently, um, Celebrex became the alternative that people would use. The dose is a lot higher, uh, you sometimes have to take a gram of this stuff to receive uh, the same benefit that a few milligrams of Biox would give you. But that's okay, because as you can imagine, the synthesis of this is rather inexpensive. So who can give us the 10 second analysis of how we would make this compound? Anyone? I can. Let's hear it. Would you do, I think you could get regio selectivity with the 1,3-dicarbonyl. Brilliant. Okay, so Daniel is telling us we can do And you suppose that the regiochemistry comes as a consequence of this one being quite a bit more delta plus than the other one, correct? Correct. Brilliant. So just dump and stir and uh, <clears throat> get your bank account ready for all the money that is in, in floating it. Okay, let's take a look at another popular compound, uh, sildenafil. And uh, this is an interesting one because we have um, two different ring systems we can take a look at. I'm not going to pay much attention to the left-hand system, I'm just going to focus on A and B here. And um, it turns out in this case, there's a lot of ways of, of skinning this cat. Um, both approaches could potentially be viable. So I'll give you five or 10 seconds to think about which one you prefer, and then we will go through both of them. 
That is, let's think about uh, taking A and annulating onto that B or taking B and annulating onto that A. In the former case, we need to use um, kind of the Pirazol synthesis logic we have been talking about all this time, followed by uh, pyrimidinone synthesis logic that we talked about last week. And in the latter case, we need to focus straight away on pyrimidinone first, followed by uh, pyrazole synthesis. Okay, so did anyone come up with the A to B strategy? No, most of you didn't. Okay, so I'll do A to B. If we cut A to B, then that means um, we're going to need to cut just like Daniel did right across here for the A to B strategy. And let's take a look at where that gave us. So it leads us down a road towards the perimeter known shown here. right and that is going to react with um, methylhydrazine uh, this thing probably is going to come from the corresponding hydrogenated compound because we know there's only one position here to be halogenated so if we make this compound it's very likely that nbs will do a good job or ncs whichever halogen you want to put there of forging that and then in order to make this one, we just go back to our notes from last time. And um, we know that this is just a three plus three disconnection. And that gets us back to a nice little amidine shown here, plus a one three dicarbonyl. So if you couple those things together, you get out the product. And then the question is your methylhydrazine selectivity, which should give uh, the right selectivity based on the rules we learned, because when condensation is your first key step, um, you know, it should favor the this nitrogen going here. And if the SNAR is your first step, it should favor it going there. So both kind of work just fine. Let's take a look at the B to A strategy, which everyone seems to be in favor of. If we do the B to A strategy, now we end up with a pyrazole nucleus like this. We've got our ester here, and we've got an NH2. And that is going to react with some sort of AR, any kind of, uh, you know, you can imagine the ester there would be just fine. The uh, amino would be fine. Um, you can find ways of condensing this uh, into uh, the, to make the perimeter known from there by way of the notes we learned last week. So how do we make this pyrazole with the correct regiochemistry? Well, first, let's get rid of this amino group we see here and bring it back to the nitro. There's only one position to nitrate. So we're feeling pretty confident about this nitration working out without a problem. And now we have to figure out a way of uh, getting this reaction to proceed. With selectivity. So in this case, it's a it's a delicate one because we taught you that condensation is going to go on this nitrogen first, and this is the more electrophilic carbonyl. So you would expect it would go there, which would give you the wrong selectivity. But by careful control of pH and solvent, you can get the correct regioisomer that you want. So this is an example of one of those slippery cases that doesn't follow the 80% rule we talked about at the very beginning. There's another way of looking at this, which is to imagine that this just comes back from a selective methylation of this compound. So if you take this compound and you try to methylate it under either acidic or basic conditions, so this is acid, or neutral, the main product you get under acid or neutral conditions is that product. 
And if you separately deprotonate this compound, the main product you get is that compound. Meaning that the dominant tautomeric form in solution is very likely going to be this. And that explains why under neutral conditions, this is a pyridine-like nitrogen, which then docks on the methyl electrophile. And under basic conditions, this is a pyro-like nitrogen that upon deprotonation has a absolutely vicious appetite for electrophiles and goes at that position. And this kind of stems from what we talked about, I think all the way back in lecture one on tautomerism. So uh, any questions on this? And all of this is kind of outlined in a very uh, cool way in the review uh, cited in this Pfizer paper and LPRD. So a lot of variable routes to make it. It's unclear what route is currently used and probably several different ones because I think the compound is generic and made by a variety of different pathways. Okay, let's take a look at this insecticide from uh, Dow published in OPRD. This one is a, uh, has a, is a pyrazole, but has a bit of saturation that we haven't seen before. So in order to put this together, we have to start thinking about um, not necessarily a 1,3-dicarbonyl. Any thoughts or suggestions on how we might get to this one rather rapidly? So you can use an alpha beta unsaturated ketone instead with the same logic for like every other piece of it. So just use hydrazine. Uh, is that what you want to do? Or just hydrazine? Just hydrazine, yeah. Yeah, you won't have any regiochemical quagmire. You'll do your, um, your addition, and following that, you'll isolate, and you'll get out your product, and there, there's no regiochemical problem there at all. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. So does that compound oxidize to uh, the active drug or does it stay like that? Do you know? Um, it's an, I, I'm not sure what the metabolism of this thing is, uh, but that seems totally reasonable that that would be a metabolite. It, as an insecticide, if you leave it outside, you know, sunlight, air, uh, microbes, um, I would be yeah. shocked if this thing wasn't oxidized. Yeah, and that could be part of the, yeah, that could be part of the strategy. I don't okay. know if we talked about it and I don't think we have any agrochemical people guest lecturing this year. Maybe that's an oversight of mine. Um, maybe we should in the future, but agrochemistry is a, if, for those of you that go into it, to me, feels even harder than medicinal chemistry. So I don't mean to offend any of the folks uh, listening in from pharma, but their job is really, really difficult because they not only have to make a compound, which let's say in the case of an insecticide, will kill only the bug, but it can't kill any humans and none of the metabolites that are ever formed can kill the humans. And it needs to biodegrade to something innocuous. And it needs to be the price uh, that you can go to Home Depot and pay, you know, five dollars for a drum of it. So the cost of goods is almost Im impossible to to think about and diabolical in terms of the complexity you can put in your molecule. Because every time you make, you know, that's why you don't see many stereos stereos under containing, uh, or they control the stereochemistry on the, on the insecticide. You you know you try to simplify it to the greatest extent you can because the cost of goods is such an important factor that you don't have in, in, in contrast to modern medicine where you can charge whatever you want. So yeah, there's your brief sidebar on agrochemical industry. Uh, hopefully some of you go into it. It's a really rewarding area. Um, we can perhaps use the same logic that, uh, so maybe Daniel can guide us through problem of the day number two really, really, really quickly. Uh, yeah, so maybe you, you can just uh, inalkylate as your last step, and then you can form the heterocycle with hydrazine. Uh, 
from the enone. You want to do some sort of uh, Buckwald or Almond, Goldberg, that way, yeah. whatever type of reaction. And yeah. then hope that the region chemistry is right there. You, you, you might get lucky, but you're probably getting a mixture. What, what I was expecting you to say is your standard disconnection you gave before, oh. which is equally fine, which would just be to get us back to AR, NH, NH2. It wasn't a trick question. And um, again, because of that difference in electrophilicity. Uh, and you know, so both the nucleophile in this case uh, there and the electrophile here are well matched to give no regiochemical ambiguity. So Acomplia, which didn't quite make it to FDA approval, but it was supposed to be the dream drug that did everything. Um, as I recall, it was for anti-obesity, it was for anti-depression. Um, it, it did too many things to list here, uh, but unfortunately didn't make it all the way such as the case with most of modern pharma, unfortunately. Okay, let's take a look at this insecticide from DuPont. Um, so what disconnection can we learn from perhaps what Alex taught us before would be potentially useful uh, for a case like this? You could use the Alpha beta unsaturated ketone with hydrazine and then quench with um, um, an ester electrophilic surrogate. That sounds pretty darn good. So if I'm gonna try to interpret what you said rapidly, you're suggesting we do something like that, correct? Um, I'm actually I meant just having the furan, um, uh, sorry, the pyran intact. Um, well, instead of having that ester, you'd have the um. Alpha beta on saturation. And then alkylate here at the end? Right. So you'll be making an, I would assume, yeah, you'd alkylate it at the end. That's very clever. I like that. Just that, right? Yep. That's pretty good. Uh, we add in hydrazine here and then acelate, and then we deprotonate. This is an acidic position, very perceptive of you. Uh, that, is a, that is a tactic I've used over the years that uh, not many people recognize very quickly, but that is a really good one. Uh, that will get you to that product, sure. You can also imagine uh, potentially taking this compound making the corresponding uh, hydrazone and then perhaps uh, reacting that with uh, formaldehyde as another potential way of going about this. And as a final pathway, you can imagine taking this and treating with hydrazine. And uh, it would also give you the product. This is what they ended up doing right here. But all the routes we have sketched out here are just fine. What you said, Noor, is totally, is, is fantastic. Great, awesome job. Okay, let's take a look at this COX-2 inhibitor from Abbott back in 2004. And so let's see, we've got two different systems here. We've got this strange as a pyran connected to a pyrazole. So we've got to figure out a way of stitching this together. Uh, would it make sense to take ring B and try to annulate onto that ring A? Um, would that make uh, any sense to you, uh, Kelly? No, I think it makes more sense to disconnect B. Okay. So if we disconnect B, let's uh, draw some key bonds here. What, what bonds do you want me to disconnect in order to annulate onto B? I think I would disconnect the O1 bond and then have like the 
Perazolone. Just get rid of that one too then. Yeah. Perazolone. And it is known when you take a Perazolone like this and you treat it under the right conditions, because you are, as we learned in lecture one, having to consider this tautomer, which uh, is a pretty happy tautomer, actually, especially with those AR groups there. There you go. Well, first step is alkylation. Second step is uh, uh, just uh, using an omen type reaction and you close it and snap it right shut. And uh, where does this thing come from? You still need that. That from the beta keto ester and hydrazine. Clayton speed. Uh, Brilliant. All right, let's take a look now at- Can I have a um, question about this, about a different disconnection? Yeah, tell me. Um, if you disconnected, I guess what you have labeled as like the N3 bond, um, and then you brought that in that same step, so put like some halogen there, and then brought that back to a 1,3 dicarbonyl, is that just not reactive enough after you add hydrazine to then do, I guess like SNAR to make that nitrogen bond onto the arrow? What you're asking here, Alex, is you'd like to put into the molecule. Is that what you want to do? Yes. The problem is when you condense with hydrazine, this is not going to stay along for the ride. Like if you use a methyl ester, for instance, it's not going to give you, it doesn't give you the methoxy compound. It, this just departs with the hydrazine. And it's oh, right, okay. So yeah, so well, that's that's a good question. Yeah, that's why you've got to you know you, the esters don't come for the ride; they're just uh, departing. Once you add the hydrazine, it's goodbye ester, and the product you're going to get out is um, you know that motif here. So what if you condensed with like a phenyl hydrazine first, then closed to form? Oh, that's a good question. So let's go to that. So let's say we added in. Uh, well, for the phenylhydrazine, what we're going to have to add in is going to be something like this. We've got to have some sort of protective compound here so that we can, we can't just, you know, take in a, maybe an alcohol, I'm not sure, it might, maybe an alcohol would be fine. And um, then the question is our uh, regiochemical outcome, which uh, based on what should we learned, selected. Should, should be okay. Um, so yeah, this is um, a reasonable disconnection, sure. I like it. No issues. Great. Awesome. All right. So it's clear everyone here is uh, pretty well mastered um, pyrazoles. Let's get into some of the quagmires that we currently encounter in the world of oxazole chemistry. So these are some old consulting questions from the archive. And uh, we need to understand how to make the two regio isomers we see here, A and B. So we need some really deep thinkers in the isoxazole series to help us out with this. You can imagine if you're a medicinal chemist, boy, these two look very similar and you probably would want both. So how do you get them? Is there perhaps a common starting material we can use? Any thoughts there, Tawe? Or perhaps Ellie can lend us a hand here. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. I, I didn't figure out how to get the, the correct selectivity. I don't care about the selectivity now. Tell me a precursor that you want to start with. So one three dicarbonate compound. Oh, that's good. So we know we need to make this.
Now, uh, when we know what our nucleophile needs to be, so when I add hydroxylamine to that, which one do you think I'm going to get, B or A? I think it would get B. Now, how would I force A into being? If the problem is the condensation is going too quickly on that oxygen of the ketone. Maybe we can train it to a iso chloride. Yeah, so you could just hydrolyze, treat it with EDC and make this intermediate, the hydroxamic acid, which will probably instantly collapse to A. Cool, you did it. Thanks, Taiwei. All right, same problem here. These are real consulting problems. So uh, the practitioner has asked, well, when we do this reaction, this is the major one we want. And as usual, Murphy's Law is in play. And that's the one they actually want. So what are we going to do now? Luckily, we cover this in the notes. The very first page, we have shown you the workaround. So who wants to give us the workaround? Page one. Do you put on a Bach curve or? Well, um, if I treated this with, uh, you know, there's not much that's gonna happen because this is a pretty bad um, nucleophile conversation. So, and I still don't know where it would go. So, um, you know, this one is not, not rock solid enough to suggest and probably won't, won't get you down the road you wanna to go to. You can start with the simple ketone and then isolate at the alpha position, like condense and then isolate. Start with the ketone and then, well, that just gets me to this. So now I'm back here. I uh, know. So before you put in the other uh, ketone fragments, condense with the hydroxylamine. Ah, nor to the rescue. Do what we did in page one of the notes. A couple of equivalents of Uli, acid chloride, and uh, out pops our minor product as our major product now. Beautiful. Super easy workaround. Don't you think? Okay, how about this one? What's our obvious uh, potential starting material for this one? Is this like a Vilsmeyer type, maybe? Oh, so you said Vilsmeyer, which probably means you want this kind of species. Correct? Yeah. But if I'm going to do this through a Bilsmeyer reaction, do you think I can make it from here? Will that work? Uh, it would have to be the other way, right? Correct. So that is a big no. So we need another way to make that. It's a great precursor. Just need another way to do it. Well, we know PLCL3 will likely give us this product if we had a compound like that in hand. And uh, all we need to do is make that, which probably comes back from that with whatever, DMF quench is fine. And this thing just comes back from a conjugate addition on beta methyl cyclohexanone. And then quench the duovisinal difunctionalization. You get out that compound or CHO here, whatever. Treat with POCL3 and you'll get out that compound. And uh, then that's it. Add in your hydrazine and you're good to go. How about uh, this species? And maybe, um, maybe Brendan, this time, 
Maybe this time you're going to come through with that Vilsmeyer on us. Now, in this problem, the practitioners wanted to, to vary uh, this area with a bunch of things. So a multitude of different areas, including heterocycles. Can we break this bond? Is that a strategic bond to break, uh, Jun Chen? No, I, I don't think you can. Yeah, yeah, this, this one is good. Uh, how, how do you want to break that one? Just use like oculation on the uh, pyridol, pyridol. Mm. Uh, uh, alkene, treating. Um, that, that, you know, so, you know, uh, let, 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 let's just draw that one out plus uh, AR and you want to add it to something like this, let's say. Yeah. Um, this is not a very good nucleophile and that's not a very good electrophile. And so neither of those bonds is very strategic to break. Instead, we're going to do what um, Brendan said before in a different context. Billsmeyer to the rescue. Where does this thing come from? Aldehyde. Perfect. So this one just uh, DMF, CL3, and um, then we get our product. Great. And making these, there's 100 ways of making these kinds of aldehydes. Super. Um, this, of course, treat, treat this with hydrazine and you get out of your product. Great. All right. So let's move on now to what happens when you start bent annulating these things. So now we have to deal with the issue of indoles. So indoles are found a lot. We learned why when we talked about indoles, because of obviously those compounds like to metabolize really well. And when they metabolize, um, you need to find an isosteer for them. And the popular isosteer is usually going to be either an azindole, which we covered ad nauseum in previous lectures. The other one that medicinal chemists will turn to if the azindole is not satisfactory is a indazole. Now, how do you make indazoles? There's um, the most popular way I have seen is going to be in blue. Normally when a medicinal chemist breaks these up, they're going to be looking for starting materials like this, ortho, halo, carbonyl compounds. And this can even be a nitrile as well if you wanna make an amino in the zone. That is the most popular. And the X can also even be nitro. In this case, an ipso uh, addition takes place um, to generate that product. Um, so the second most useful way of making indazoles by sort of my own opinion of what I've seen is the isomerization with uh, following nit nit uh, nitrosylation of an aniline, uh, an orthoalkyl aniline. And um, that's very general. So it doesn't only need to be methyl, this can be any alkyl and it works. So you can have all sorts of substituents out here, alcohols, uh, amines, whatever, and those will uh, grab on to that alkyl position and form an indazole through a mechanism that you're gonna teach me in just a minute. And then finally, you can imagine forging the NN bond by a dehydration pathway. So these types of amino oxymes, when you treat them with a dehydrating agent, uh, like mesyl chloride, will collapse and give you the indazole as well. All three of these methods are useful, but I just mentioned to you the sort of priority order in terms of the frequency which you see each of them. So in order to understand uh, this strange nitrosylation one, we should probably go through it in a little bit of detail. And that is problem of the day number four. So let's see if anyone can volunteer to help us understand mechanistically what goes on in this very, very useful uh, transformation. Uh, I can do it. Great. What do you say, Simona? How do I, how do, I do this? So you form the nitroso first.
Now what? And then you can grab that acetyl with the oxygen, so like a rearrangement. And then the, the hydrogen there is very acidic. So um, you can pluck that off with the oxygen um, and lose um, to, and form the nitrine. Yeah, lose that acetate. And then you can close that to form the imbazole. Awesome, that's how it works. Uh, literature, you see sometimes the uh, ones with the analid. Sometimes you also see it made in C2 from the aniline with the acetic anhydride. Um, the key to remember is that you can use an ortho aniline and the aniline can be acetylated in, in C2 to get this procedure to, uh, to go and whatnot. And again, remember that doesn't need to be a methyl. It can be any alkyl group except the butyl obviously. Okay, so let's take a look at some real world examples of some really cool uh, indazole uh, syntheses. The first one is this Pfizer PDE4 inhibitor. Uh, one of my favorite examples of an indazole, indazole synthesis. Um, this one comes from, as I remember, uh, Stefan Carone, one of the uh, giants of process chemistry. And um, I need a good disconnection for this to begin with. Uh, so, we can start, I'm not gonna eliminate this residue. I'm gonna leave it in there and uh, let you sort of guide us through what disconnection we might think about. We can either start with the indazole or we can start with something on the other side. Um, any suggestions for how we can put this together based on this little box right here, we're gonna use this box over and over again. So commit that to memory. Any thoughts? You could start with the aniline um, and so like essentially break between the nitrogen nitrogen bonds and do a dehydrative um, cyclization. So you start with the oxygen. And how do I get that from the corresponding ketone? Um, how do you make the ketone itself? Well, no, I'm just, I'm drawing your, so I would, I would get it from this compound, right? By some sort of. Yes. Perhaps or whatever. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, that is potentially good. The, the only issue is sort of the number of steps involved here. So let's bring it all the way back to the aniline. And now uh, I'm going to draw the other little piece, which you can't escape from, Noor. Now make that. Yeah, that's going to be. Um... Mm. So let's go back up to our little box. You chose this strategy. I'm going to say, let's write that one off. Is there another one we can use? If we use... This one here on the right, it means that we need a methyl group there. Is that going to help you simplify this puzzle? Also, no, right? Yeah. However, if we bring this back to a compound like this, watch what happens. Now we know we can add in Our rules that we talked about at the very beginning of class, when condensation is employed, that nitrogen will go first. The more nucleophilic one is here, and that's going to do the SNAR. So we're matched. We have a matched pair. Now, if I think about this R group, guess what? This just comes back from that 
wherein the SNAR can take place here first, and then you can make your indazole. You can also make your indazole first, followed by the SNAR. You can do both of those strategies. And subsequently, you have to worry about the um, cis versus trans. So the cool thing here is that the final product is a thermodynamic one where you minimize uh, interactions here and the aryl and the ester are equatorial. So after this resulting addition takes place here, you can simply treat that with a base to equilibrate to the, the thermodynamic one shown here. And uh, where does this thing come back from? Well, that's just Friedel crafts from dirt. Difluorobenzene, Friedel crafts, indazole formation, SNAR, isomerization, and you're done. No palladium needed for this one, folks. It's pretty, pretty cool, huh? And hydrolyzing that to the ester is selective. Acid. <clears throat> yes, it's selective. But, sterics. Okay, okay, over sterics. Great question. You can read about this in the OPRD, but they initially looked at the version where you have um, a diester and a monoester nitrile, but then they found that the dinitrile can be easily differentiated just by sterics. So great, great question. The magic of process chemistry. All right, let's take a look at this example from Abbott, uh, or I guess Abby now, uh, compound for obesity. Is there a quick way we can put this together? Well, I think if you remove the amide bond and the alkyl substituent, you've got a similar precursor as problem of day four. Wow, look at that. That might be the problem of the day. Or very similar to it. That's cheap and commercial. Uh, treat that with nit nit nitrosylation conditions and uh, alkylate and then reduce the nitro and then make the amide. Brilliant. All right. So let's take a look then at some real world problems. Uh, the first of which is this interesting uh, nitro indazole. Is there a quick way of making this compound? Yeah, could you disconnect to the nitrile um, and add in hydrazine um, and maybe have like an SNAR? Yeah. Brilliant. Would that nitro group present regioselectivity? issues? Um, no, it's going to help you actually. Your, your, your SNAR is going to happen and then uh, cyclization. Once the SNAR happens, there's only one way to go. Yeah. Well, you know, that example I showed you above of this IPSO attack is a very strange uh, observation and is exclusive to a system like this where there's nothing else that can happen. This one here, uh, Daniel. Okay. So no, you in, in the case of a nitrochloro, especially with another activating group here, this is Chlorine is going to, you know, leave with reckless abandon. Okay, how about this next one? If you how to make this? Copper cyanide. We'll do it. Oh, I don't. Know. Uh, but that's where you would you would enter you enter SciFinder with that one, right? Because your heterocycle logic is done already, and now the easy part of finding where my building block comes from. So, okay, great. How about uh, this next one? Is there a uh, this one? Boy, uh, what's unusual about this one? Well, we've got now this you know a another this ester here hiding. So we need to find a way of putting that in. There's several ways of looking at this problem, but. Um, who can guide us down a road that might be logical? I was thinking from the, you could use hydrazine in a similar manner to the previous one where you could do SNAR on an aryl halide. Brilliant, that sounds really good. Now, how do we make this thing? 
uh, maybe Friedel Kratz? Or... Unfortunately, we'll have the problem where you have um, this benzyl group is, is really a pain in the butt because we've got competing regiochemical problems. Like why wouldn't it go here, for example? And so there could be regiochemical problems. So the way to look at this one is, well, how about directed methylation? Directed methylation could go here or it could go here. The fact that you've got two directing groups probably leads you to think that directed methylation might go there. That's a problem. So then you start searching in the literature for uh, materials you could use. And the one that is eventually found as being really, really cheap is that one. That's very cheap. Now, all we need to do is um, convert that carboxylic acid into a alpha keto ester. There's a couple, couple of ways of doing this. Um, and either the Bode technique or the Wasserman technique are very, very simple ways of, and if you're interested in that, um, Tucker and Max can send you the original papers, but are very mild ways of taking acids, like the Nugent homologation that gives you an alpha chloroketone. The Bode and Wasserman methods will give you the alpha keto ester very easily in mild conditions from the corresponding carboxylic acid. So this is a really useful tactic to remember down the road when you're making heterocycles of which uh, alpha keto esters can be really, really useful building blocks. So, uh, but yeah, that's, um, you know, if you, you want to test, of course, you could just propose starting from here because you wouldn't know that this is not so readily available. That halogen metal exchange and quenching with here would be a perfect answer on a test. So no problem with that. But don't put Friedel Crafts because Friedel Crafts, of course, has got this regiochemical problem. That makes sense, Daniel? So just put the bromine there on the test. Okay, let's take a look at this other example. This is a really interesting one. And uh, it exposes you for the first time now to a bridging heterocycle. Now, because we don't know how to make bridging heterocycles already, we're gonna have to simplify this a little bit. So we've got three different ring systems. We've got a triazole, which we've never seen. And we've got that bridging heterocycle, which we've never seen. So let's disconnect it and uh, tell you how it works as a sneak peek of what we're gonna be talking about next week. So this can come as a consequence of dehydration of an intermediate like that. And this just comes back from the amide. How do you do that? Well, you can just treat it with PLCL3. That'll give you the imminoyl chloride. And then the imminoyl chloride can be attacked with your semi-carbazide. So uh, we've gotten through how to make that triazole fuse. And now we just have to think about making this pyrazole, which is the topic of today's lecture. So let's think about ways we might be able to put this together. Anything immediately come to mind? Can you use 1,3 dicarbonyl logic? Yeah, why don't we do that? So if we do that, it leads us down a road to that or X there is just fine. There may be a here. And then we know when we add in is it matched up? Yes, it looks matched up. Condensation goes here, the nucleophilic attack goes there. And then we just need a quick and simple way of putting that together. Well, Kelly, any ideas how to put that together? Any bond I could break? Um, can you break the two, three bond? If we do that, it leads us to a very, very simple starting material. And uh, 
here's your product. So just treat that potassium tripitoxide and um, you get out your product. All right, so, um, and of course, if you don't want methoxy, you can turn it, you can use the halogen, whatever, it's just fine. Um, so let's, with that, let's move on to this rather striking example of a drug which was radio labeled at this position of the pyrazole. Let's do a cage match. I think for the first time we've done this between medicinal chemists and radio chemists who in this case have a rather bizarre problem that you'll, you'll discover in a moment. From the med chem standpoint, what is the bond that we want to get rid of right away? What can we disconnect so that we can make maybe, let's say, lots of analogs of this side chain and lots of analogs of that side chain? What bond would we disconnect? Who are our medicinal chemists? Um, let's see, we haven't heard from Ellie. Do you want to give it a shot? Yeah, sure. I was thinking maybe you could break the like an alkyl bond. Oh, great. Um, okay, so that gives us that through a reductive emanation. Brilliant. All right. Now we just have to figure out a way to make that thing. Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe we could look at the 1,3-dicarbonyl. Yeah. Dicarbonyl, you can't lose. And because it is a 5-5 five, five system, you actually go through the intermediacy of this strange creature. It doesn't immediately eliminate it. when you treat it with mesyl chloride and base. However, you do get the product. Dehydration takes place, and then mesylation takes place at um, that nitrogen. Now. Let's switch over to the medicinal chem uh, to the radiochemistry side of things. Things get uh, pretty difficult here. Um, is there an obvious uh, thing that you can try for um, this particular compound? Like the route I show here. Um, oh, how do I make that? I forgot to tell you. NR here and just treat it with DMF, DMA. So. Could I do the same thing? Tim, is that reasonable? Yeah, you can just use radio label DMF DMA. Sure. Just use radio label DMF DMA. Everyone's wondering why did you pose such a silly problem, Phil? It doesn't look like a cage match at all. Looks like they get along just fine. So they ordered the DMF DMA from multiple vendors. It looked fine but under no conditions that they ever get the product. And this is one of the dirty little secrets of radiochemistry, which maybe when the guest lecturers come, you can ask them about this question of how often does the hot chemistry not work and the cold chemistry does? I see this a lot. It's kind of unexplainable. There's no explanation for why the C14 DMF DMA doesn't work, but the cold one does. Um, Probably it's best to ask the guest lecturers when we have radiochemists visit and ask them. They see this happen all the time. Um, can't give you a good answer for it. All I can tell you is that this is, you know, part of the challenge of being in radiochemistry. So what they need to do is actually invent a different formulating agent. That's the one they use. And then it gets, it gets more difficult after this as well. So when they do the sulfonylation, they actually find they get this compound out. 
However, if you treat this with terpetoxide, it isomerizes to that one. Can anyone rationalize this? How in the world does that happen? You go through the sulfoling uh, intermediate. Ah, brilliant. So sulfoline is lost when you deprotonate minus SO2 there. That gives rise to two equilibrating anions. That one plus that one. And this one is the one that goes about uh, attacking, reattacking the sulfoline, the sulfine to give the product. So very cool isomerization of the wrong sulfur, uh, 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 the wrong sulfonamide product to the correct one. And a sort of uh, reminder of the challenge of radiochem and that just because something works in the cold step doesn't mean you're gonna get as lucky when you do it hot. And again, I don't know the answer as to why, neither do the, the authors of this paper. And um, I've asked this question of the folks who are gonna be lecturing you later this semester. Uh, they don't know either, but you can ask them the question again. So is that the thermodynamic? Uh, yes. And I'm, okay. And uh, let's move on to isoxazoles. So, um, you may realize that we're running short on time, but the great news is that we're doing more of this on Wednesday. So I can take my time. I don't need to rush through this. Let's take a look at the side chain of mycofungin, which is a, I think is a compound that is sold under the brand name of Fungard, which is, I guess, the small molecule equivalent of taking this class. All right. So how do we make this from a medchem standpoint or a process standpoint? Well, if we need to make lots and lots of analogs very quickly of Fungard, uh, what would you prefer to do in a medchem setting? Um, Simona, any ideas? Can you do a cycle addition? Yeah, if you're gonna make tons and tons of analogs, it might make sense to simply disconnect right across the ring, right here. And um, that leads us down the road towards AR alkyne, of which we can make a bazillion jillion of them through Sangashiras. And then AR prime and hydroxylamine, add it in to the aldehyde, then treat it with NCS. So this comes from AR aldehyde, that's hydroxylamine, then NCS. And we're uh, dumping and stirring and making all sorts of fun uh, guard analogs. Now, in process chemistry, you're probably not going to want to do this just because uh, uh, the dipolar cycle addition could be an exotherm. You have to make an alkyne. The alkyne either requires an ohira Bespin reagent or a Sonigashira. It has palladium. Um, there's halogen waste. There's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to do the dipolar on process scale if you had another viable option. So for the process option, um, Carter, do you know what 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 uh, what uh, option we have there? Um, well, I suppose you'd have regiochemistry issues if you just wanted to use uh, ah, hydroxyl amine. Well, let's let's talk about it. So the obvious uh, um, process disconnection would be the one across here. But uh, Carter brings out a very good point that uh, we're going to be in trouble with that uh, Rico chemical outcome. Now, you, one thing you'll notice is that on the left-hand side, there is an electron withdrawing group, which should make this um, carbonyl more likely to be attacked by hydroxylamine. And you do see some small preference. Now, in practice, what the process chemists did is they actually made this enamide. They could crystallize out that enamide selectively and then react that enamide with loss of ammonia with hydroxylamine to get even more exquisite selectivity. So the lesson here is that on 
in a process setting, if it looks reasonable on paper that one of these carbonyls should be more electrophilic than the other, it is a good idea to really study how you can tease out that very subtle difference between the carbonyls because the benefit of starting from this is obvious from a cost of goods standpoint. That doesn't require any palladium. That doesn't require any halogen waste. It's just a condensation where you lose water. There's no exotherm. Um, so this works when there is a clear differentiation from of the two carbonyl groups. Even if it is subtle, there is one here. Great. So uh, let's move on to this factor 10A inhibitor from BMS, uh, this patent. Uh, and uh, so disconnecting this compound, why don't we just simply uh, lop off this side chain right away and get us back to this simple pyrazole. We'll just put an E here. All right, now we have to think about ways of making this. Any thoughts? Can you use one three dicarbonyl again to make the? Uh, oh, we got two. We got two that potentially can be uh, used in one three dicarbonyl. But I heard you say pyrazole, so yep. let's do the top one first. So we've got A and B. So an A focused scheme will revolve around making Now, Kelly, how are you going to differentiate those two? You might need to do some kind of protection. And what would that be? Can you protect the ester as the furan, like we talked about last time? That is the back scenario they do. Uh, Fantastic for remembering that, Kelly. So now we have a clear differentiation of these two. That's very delta plus, and uh, that should work without any regiochemical ambiguity. And uh, at the end, we can just unveil that furan with MTBPA, CAM104, whatever. It's not going to touch any of the other functionality. What if we go down the route of thinking about B? If you think about B, we can imagine that maybe an NC bond formation will take place. Put a bromo there. We have to make that uh, pyrazole. We can make the pyrazole using uh, Kelly's technique. And now we need a route to make that uh, amino isoxazole. Where does that come from? Can you add hydroxylamine into the nitrile? Yes, you can. So the first thing that's going to happen is addition into the nitrile. In cases where it is sluggish, you can actually accelerate it just by taking that nitrile and turning it into the imminoyl chloride. That makes it even better. The imminoyl ester also works fine. Anyway, adding that in followed by continued heating undergoes SNAR reaction, and that gets you to that compound, which you can then link together with a Buckwald, Ullman, Goldberg, whatever and then hope and pray that the regiochemistry is right. If you find that the regiochemistry is wrong, however, the topmost approach is gonna be the way to go because we don't have to think about regiochemistry. Does that make sense? All right. And um, for, I have a quick question. For the um, uh, synthesis of ring A, instead of 
using a furan as a protecting group, can we do a late stage uh, deprotonation isolation or would that be problematic in the system? It would be problematic just because you've got that free NH2. We're going to need to put protecting groups on there. Uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it could work if you do it that way. Um, you just, you know, then you've got the, the sort of difficulty of uh, dealing with this functionality. Okay. So you've Thanks. got a, some good protecting group for that. And maybe this PMB or something might be okay. Thalamite is not going to be very stable on a compound like that. So it just avoids having to protect. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, Risperdal. So um, this is an interesting compound. Um, and we need to think about ways that we would put this together very quickly. Now, um, it's pretty clear that we can probably disconnect this molecule straight down the middle. And that gives us two simple building blocks. So let's draw one of them. That amine could then add into this pyrimidinone. So that disconnection is fine. So we already learned how to make pyrimidones. Um, anybody, can anybody sort of identify a, a disconnection for this one? based upon, um, I guess, last week's lectures. We've got ring A and we've got ring B here. You can bring that back to the um, like alpha keto ester. So breaking up ring A. Like that? Yep. And um, <clears throat> this compound basically is nothing more than this, which is hiding. This lactone is the form that you'll buy that compound. You see it? And um, in practice, though, they do not use this amidine. In practice, they just use two aminopyridine. So two aminopyridine is used and the subsequent bridged heterocycle that you get can be easily reduced because the intermediate you get from that is this charged species, which definitely wants to reduce. So, but if you drew that on test, it's certainly fine. You can certainly make that compound from the corresponding either uh, nitrile by cyclization or from the corresponding lactam through losses as a reagent followed by adding an amine. Uh, but this is the way they do it from the two amino period. And in the final one minute of class, we have to come up with a way of making that. Do you have a quick way of doing it? You start with labeled acetone. Oh no, sorry. Uh, hold that thought for tomorrow. Our uh, Wednesday, uh, Tim. I need to make this still. You can bring it back to the difluoro. Brilliant. Well, that's it. We are right on time. And we know that uh, Tim is going to start us off on Wednesday with that problem. So be ready, Tim. Hopefully you have the right answer there. Now we'll look, continue to this consulting corner. We're going to go into some deep uh, details of p result chemistry. We're going to continue with these case studies on Wednesday. And don't worry, I know many of you have been very upset because so far I haven't talked about isothiazoles. But that is coming on Wednesday. So all the hate mail we're getting, please hold it back. It's coming on Wednesday. I know you want to hear about isothiazoles and how they came about in the world and where they're used and how they're made. 
So with that, have a great rest of the day and we shall see you on Wednesday.